Hello and welcome to the Indian Cultural Forum. Today we have a very special guest with us. We have Ruth Fanita. She is a professor at University of Montana, but prior to that, she taught at Delhi University for many, many years. Thank you very much, Van, for <laughs> your time. Thank you. Uh, just by way of introduction, but I'm sure a lot of you know this, uh, she co-founded Manushi, and, uh, which was the first nationwide feminist magazine, and she has several books to her credit, but uh, we'll actually be discussing this particular book which has been brought out by uh, Speaking Tiger Books. It's called Dancing with the Nation. And, uh, but she's also the author of several other books and edited several other books, including the iconic same-sex love in India. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to begin uh, uh, with uh, your discussion and some of the points that you make in your introduction. Uh, you call the Tawaibs uh, a product or, 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 or a part or a tradition of indigenous modernity in India. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us, uh, for our viewers who may not have read this book yet, what, what do you mean by this indigenous modernity? Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, before this book, my earlier book was called Gender, Sex and the City, 2012. And in that book, I looked at Urdu poetry from late 18th, early 19th century, mainly produced in Lucknow. And there I found, I discovered that courtesans in this poetry emerge as sort of the female intellectuals of the time. They are named by name. And uh, they are uh, friends of male poets. Uh, they perform in, for the same patrons in the same uh, forums. And uh, they are very, uh, they are basically the stars of the city and uh, the city itself has a very hybrid uh, cultural life uh, and a hybrid I mean uh, the languages languages uh, the poets write in more than one language I looked at the Urdu poetry but they write in other languages as well including Braj Bhasha and Punjabi and Awadhi and uh, Marwadi uh, so the poets are polyglots and the courtesans uh, also perform this the, the poetry that the poets write and the markets of Lucknow have people and goods from all over the world, like French gauze and Chinese people and traders and so on. So it's a buzzing city with uh, what one could call a sort of proto-consumerist culture. And and when I read some of this poetry out today to modern audiences, they can't believe it was written so long ago. It's completely colloquial Urdu, which is totally understandable right now. So uh, the idea, so I, in that book, I challenged the idea that modernity is a product of colonialism, which we usually think. And I suggested that there is a kind of indigenous modernity which has the mark of modernity, like hybridity of, of urban cultures. And uh, the courtesans are uh, very much part of this culture. They are like modern women in one sense. And in Bombay cinema too, we see some of the, uh, the courtesans uh, functioning as modern women, for example, driving their own cars and giving the male protagonist a lift in their cars, um, living in very westernized sort of backgrounds. In films like Benazir or Shire 1949, um, you see them doing these things and having their own property, their own income, uh, you know, anthropologist Veena Oldenburg found that courtesans were the only women in 19th century Lucknow who were in the highest income tax bracket. They owned their own property and land, and they lived in these mixed households of women who were both Hindu and Muslim and practiced uh, uh, different, had different cultural and religious practices. So, um, uh, and courtesans were also the first women to actually shape Indian cinema. Uh, they, the first Indian woman the film director was a co from a courtesan background, the first woman producer, and most of the early actors, singers, choreographers, the women who participated were mostly courtesans. So they shaped cinema, which is the most modern of forms, uh, art forms. Your book, however, is not sort of a history of these figures, uh, no. but it's it's more of uh, a reading of the representation of mm -hmm. courtesans in yeah. Bombay cinema. In, uh, in, in your introduction, uh, you say, and I'll just take that quote out, you say that uh, many, many film critics' patriarchal bias is evident in the sweeping studies of Bombay cinema that ignore courtesan films. So, uh, and then you actually uh, mention some of the works and you pit your work against theirs. Um, in terms of representation and discussion of the courtesan figure in Bombay cinema, what, has, what have been the conclusions that you came? There have been several essays on this figure, on the courtesan characters in films, and some of them have been good uh, essays. But there's been no full-length book-length study of courtesans figures. And um, uh, when I said that, the, the, the patriarchal bias, what I meant was that when the, when the, the studies which are about cinema and the nation, uh, these usually map the conventional patriarchal family onto the nation and say that it's... Uh, 
it's you know the nation is patriarchalizes the family and then having said that it's the uh, the critics tend to look at the male protagonist as defining various eras. So you have the Dilip Kumar era and the Amitabh Bachchan era and so on. But you don't have, say, the Hima Malini era or the Madhubala era. So the, the, it's more, and I feel that it's more the commentator's bias to view it like this because actually there were major female stars and major female-oriented films. And most of these female-oriented films when the courtesan was the central character in films like Chitralekha or, uh, or even Mughal Azam, you know, Anarkali is, as much the lead figure as as uh, is uh, Salim, so um, yeah, so it's not just Pakistan Umrauja on which I've got too much attention, but numerous uh, films uh, set in many parts of the country in Calcutta and Mumbai and Lucknow and Delhi and uh, Banaras, uh, showing um, female protagonists, the Kotazan very often as a figure who's a single woman who is mobile, who lives in unconventional uh, household arrangements, sometimes a matrilineal household, sometimes on her own with sort of an adopted brother, an adopted child, or an adopted sister, uh, with unconventional families, which male protagonists do very often. But female protagonists usually don't have the uh, mobility to do that in movies, but the Kotazan does because she's uh, not living a traditional domesticated uh, life. And um, so courtesans have kind of been put in a category of the, on their own and not treated as women. But if you look at them as women, then this is the modern uh, Indian woman, um, one facet of the modern Indian woman. And uh, the first group of working women who have careers, who are shown to build, have property, who are shown to have their own houses, uh, like in a film like Sangharsh uh, in the 1960s. Um, so by Janti Mala, she, so she uh, moves around. Her name is, Lai, she has the title Laila Asman, but her name is Munni. And she goes from Banaras to Lakhanao to Calcutta. And uh, she owns her own house and she tells the hero that, look, it's my house, you, can't, you know, I'm going to do what I want in it. So that's just one example. So you have these very assertive women who also pursue the man that they want, or they don't want any man, they want to just live with an adopted, there's a Meena Kumari film in which she just lives with, with her adopted brother, and she doesn't want any relationships with men, she has an adopted brother and an adopted son, and that's the unconventional family that she has. So with respect to some of the figures that you've mentioned, uh, um, now, in, in, in recent times, we've, we've, we've seen this resurgence of the idea of, of India as, as, as the mother and, and Bharat Mata, etc. How do you see some of these figures that you just discussed now? How, do you think that they, they can also find a place in the idea of, of uh, the Bharat Mata or, or the, the mother figure in, 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 in India? Yes, interestingly, uh, a number, I mentioned to you, the, uh, the courtesan was shown adopting a son, and that's a very common uh, plot line, uh, the courtesan who either has a child herself or who uh, adopts a child and raises the child either her alone herself or with a mother or an aunt or a female friend or a male friend who is like a brother in these unconventional situations. And like Nargis and Mother India, she is a figure of great strength and who can, uh, who, who mothers not only her own child, but uh, also can at times be mothering a community. And a good example is the burning train in 1980 where uh, the courtesan just happens to be on the train she's singing a song and all the people on the train who are representatives of different communities Indian communities all join in the song and the dance but then the train gets set on fire and they need to throw a red cloth out of uh, on the stand and no the women married women are not willing to give their so haki jodi or whatever and so she takes off her sari so she's like I call her like a new Draupadi because the sari is not taken off but she takes it off because she says you know modesty is less important than saving people's lives and basically saving the nation because the train represents that and she says I will give my uh, uh, and then they all thank her, say, thank you, madam. And then she's shown holding a baby which has been born on the train. So we, next, uh, all the later vision we, we have of her is of her holding that baby who has been born on the train. She's, she's the mother who's protecting the child born on the train, the future of the nation, as it were. So yes, interestingly, you won't expect this, but the uh, courtesans are very often referred to as goddess figures. They, and I have a whole chapter on them as various kinds of goddess figures, new kinds of goddess figures, and old kind of goddess figures, uh, as Sita, as Savitri, as Duru. So very as Durga, definitely as Durga, um, and as Ganga, uh, Ramteri Ganga, Meli, but many other films too, as Ganga, and also as uh, as 
all of these are mother figures, but as a mother, and also as Lakshmi and Saraswati, and there's the whole debate about whether the art that she practices and she's transmitting classical music and dance, can it be called the art of Saraswati or not? And there's a whole debate in movies around that. But, and Lakshmi again, you know, because she's definitely earning money and bringing in money and so on, but is this tainted money or not? Or what? So, so there's a debate around all of these things. But definitely she's there with the goddess figures as are other female protagonists. Yeah. Thank you. We'll wind up our discussion on the book, but we'll come back and discuss uh, some other things with you. Thank okay. you very much for your time, Rudvanita. Thank you very much for watching.